Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I am Elaine Ellis, and I am a marketing manager at Trata. I will be moderating today's panel. We are doing a series of webinars um, to help everybody with paid search. Today's topic is agencies stop letting PPC suck your margins dry. Um, we will also be doing a webinar in July on holiday paid search, so keep an eye open or out for that email. Um, today's topic, we really want to help you guys be more efficient with your paid search. Really, paid search is very tactical. We wanted to find some ways so you can spend less time on paid search and more time with your clients. Um, we'll Today's agenda, we will be doing best practices for getting your clients started. And then we will also be talking about how you guys can really be switching your time as an agency from the tactical to the strategic. Um, we'll also be talking about mining keyword gold, ways that you guys can find high converting keywords that will really um, increase conversions for your clients. We will also talk about integrating your PPC campaign into the rest of your marketing campaign. A lot of times PPC is orphaned off to the side. Uh, we'll also talk about the results reporting that really matters to your clients when it comes to paid search. And then we'll also give you an overview of Trata, who we are and what we do. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A. We really want this to be interactive, so please send your questions along the way as they pop up. And then at the end, we will queue them up and uh, answer them for you. Dan Tisser today is one of our account managers, and he will be uh, doing the overview of paid search. Dan has been working in paid search for multiple years, uh, or has previously worked in multiple years as an agency, so he really understands the pain points that you guys have and is currently at Trata, so I think he can really address how you guys can be more efficient with your time and how you guys can really um, make paid search effective for your agency. Our first practice, we'll be talking about best practices for getting a client started. Yeah, thanks Elaine, thanks for that intro, and I really don't hate NASCAR that much. Um, just trying to be funny, I guess. Um, so yeah, so the, the majority of the clientele that we see come through and, 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 and things that I see to be a personally good fit for paid search in general falls into three major categories, uh, e-commerce, lead generation, and branding. Uh, jumping right into it, so the way that, that I like to think of why paid search works particularly well for e-commerce is that you have a site that is connected directly to cost per click against an actual cost per acquisition goal of a particular hard product being sold. Also by the very nature of the way that websites are laid out and play very well uh, in the e-commerce world for paid search. So one of our advertisers that we currently work with right now is a, a company that has gone from wholesale to direct sales to consumer. It's called Alternative Apparel. And they, their basic uh, layout of, of the product categories that they sell is women's clothing, men's, babies, toddlers, and a host of accessories. And the way that those map out, it really works very well uh, in terms of how we want to layer uh, the ad groups and the campaigns and how we build things in particular. So obviously the nice thing is that you, you put on your marketing hat uh, and you look at things at, at the different layers that are there. And for every layer you can add in various campaigns, uh, ad groups, and whatnot. And it works really well uh, for, for paid search. So here's just, just some basic ideas of how to think about how to lay out your campaign that you would do, one for women's, one for men's. Um, and then the, the permutations on women's casual, women's formal, and so on, and then various things like that. Uh, this next slide here is something that I wanted to show is what we call a disambiguation page. Uh, it's to be a fantastic place to put in an ad group that is the general category for all the short sleeve t-shirts and regular shirts are uh, alternative cells um, and allows av uh, uh, users that are looking at the website to come in and take a look at the various products um, from a style standpoint, price standpoint, even the brands. And that also can get you thinking about the different ways to go set up a campaign that you might have different uh, brand campaigns out there or different colors, uh, things like that, and all the different permutations that, that can come up there. Uh, also, you have the ability then to go drive into the, the details page, the actual landing page uh, of an e-commerce site. 
um, that shows the, the, the particular goods and all the attributes they have that would be just that one product and then you can design your keyword selection and add copy selection around that. One thing to keep in mind that when you're working with e-commerce clients is that you, uh, you may be the paid search expert, but you're not going to be the subject matter expert. Uh, what really leverages well in the relationship between the advertiser uh, slash client and the, the agency people is that you can leverage all that great information that the people that own the website have. So if there's particular things that you know that they may know that they want to either promote, uh, that they know that they have best sellers that particularly work well in a brick and mortar store situation. Uh, if there's extra inventory they need to get rid of, or, or uh, stagnant inventory they need to, to put on the and, and get out the door, and then exclusivity. And I let uh, say that last one uh, to demonstrate that, for example, alternative apparel they are in the whole sides, wholesale side of things, but they also have a lot of exclusive labels that aren't found anywhere else. And if there's any sustainable differentiation that they could have is that these exclusive products are available only on their website and there might be some hard to find styles on there and those are, are great things to leverage when considering uh, ad copy and whatnot too. So e-commerce, the reason why I chose this one first to go after to show like how to map things out is probably the most complex. These are the ones that you're going to probably be spending the most time going out and building all the different permutations on name brand, on style, on gender, and occasion and things like that. Uh, the next field that we're moving into is lead generation. Uh, that's why I call the, the higher involvement purchases. Uh, it's very uh, helpful to know how people go out and they buy their information and how they're, they're trying to get things done. Uh, the auto insurance realm is quite possibly the most competitive uh, and uh, also the largest budgets out there. If you were to go pull a report on the, the company that's, that spend the most money, Progressive, uh, Geico, uh, State Farm, companies like that spend a tremendous amount of money because they know that the, the lifetime value of a customer is worth thousands of dollars in, uh, per client and they're not afraid to go after and, and chase uh, expensive keywords down. Uh, so knowing that you know people don't necessarily go out and they buy online and auto insurance, that they might be shopping around instead of just going out and outright purchasing, that you want to know a little bit about the behavior of how that works. So if there's functionality that coincides with, say, a pay-per-click campaign where people have the ability to go out there and search for quotes and then compare those quotes around. So, uh, progressive, of course, has leveraged the idea that they will show you the competitive quotes on their website, which can help people move from that shopping mode to that buying mode, and then everything starts with what keywords they're buying and the ad copy that they um, that they leverage. And here, in this case, it's it's in the quote information. So that kind of ties us into you know how people buy things. So knowing that you know if, if people need to just be aware of what a particular brand is, um, and the uh, looking and shopping and comparing treating their own kind of disambiguation in their mind as far as what they're trying to, to highlight when they're shopping around for different quotes uh, and, and lead generation. And knowing that, you know, people in the insurance world are certainly going to be focused around quotes um, and the actual monthly price. If you're in the mortgage business, going to be interest rates, uh, real estate, then it might be on location. So, so knowing the, the audience and how uh, they particularly buy your client's products and, and knowing if you're doing lead generation that you know where they're at in the buying cycle. Another great opportunity to go out there and leverage the information that those subject matter experts have. Uh, the next type of campaign, what we call a branding campaign, uh, this is stuff that we work with a lot. Um, this is a, a particularly good example that we have here for a San Francisco bike shop that only does business in San Francisco. So they're not actually selling bikes online. Their, their conversion and the, what they're trying to do here is, is to get people to come visit their shop or perhaps pick up the phone and find instructions, maybe see some neat functionality about building your own bike. Uh, and that also what's happening here too is that there's some geo-targeting that's taking place here. So if I live in Denver and I'm going to be visiting San Francisco looking at a bike shop, that's a very reasonable search query that I'd come up with a San Francisco bike shop. And that ad is only going to be delivered to people that either target things on the keyword level by qualifying it with that particular city name or people that are going to be uh, in the San Francisco area that might type in bike shop and that ad would only be delivered to those particular areas. So being aware of how those geo-targeting uh, works and then the different ways of targeting those particular things is, is very helpful. What's nice also is that you'll see that little uh, that mention in San Francisco right below the display URL. Uh, this is something that Google adds in when they find that a particular uh, area is being used for uh, the IP targeting here. In this case you get to see the San Francisco, California thing pop up. So that's not something that they actually would put into uh, the particular part of uh, the, the campaign where you can actually choose what city that is broadcasted in. 
Um, these particular uh, types of campaigns work really well for those uh, stores that are trying to drive foot traffic and, and perhaps people picking up the phone. Some best practices around how to really go after those, those types of campaigns. Um, that you're setting an expectation with the, the, the smaller clients that are you know, more or less probably going to be the, some of the smaller budgets out there. That, you know, that the expectation is here that we're trying to send traffic, that you're not necessarily going to be selling bikes in this case over the phone. Um, that you want to be very sensitive to geo-targeting and, and um, when using what IPs to address and then how you cookie cutter up the United States to, to send those IP targeting out. And then also then the, the geo-targeting that happens at the keyword level that you also are capturing things like Pacific Heights, Mission Union Square, Castro, particular uh, neighborhood names. And then, of course, this type of knowledge is only things that are typically gathered by people that know the area really well, uh, that live there, and then going out and keeping like a, a database of your own neighborhood names for popular uh, geographics are a great way to go build some new keywords and some permutations out there. And we'll cover out uh, how that works. And then also uh, putting in your phone number in the ad, if you have the ability to sub uh, substitute a a uh, unique phone number that is only being used in paid search, you can certainly put that in the ad. And what that does is that um, it, first of all, saves you a click. They pick up the phone, and uh, more or less a conversion is taking place. People are interested in your business. And then when that phone line rings, that you know that those particular phone calls are coming off your paid search. So you have the ability to uh, close the loop on the analytics back end with your advertiser as far as, far as how things are, are coming through, uh, through the, the paid search and what's resulting in actionable uh, things from people that are visiting the website and perhaps just the ad. Another thing to consider too is the day parting as well. Uh, knowing how your, your clients might go shop, um, I'm sorry, how your customers might go shop for a particular item. Uh, bike shops are not necessarily going to be delivering traffic at 3 in the morning on a Monday. So you know, considering that you might want to only run on the ads when the, the store is open, when someone's there to pick up the phone, uh, and that you know, perhaps run 24-7 on the weekends, things like that. So those types of behavioral information uh, is always helpful to understand uh, from your client. As an agency, we know that you guys really want to spend your time with your clients focusing on the strategic rather than the tactical. The next couple of slides will really kind of hone in on that. Thanks, Lane. So the way, what I mean by that, what we mean by this is that, you know, the, Obviously, as you know, doing any kind of work in paid search is very meticulous, very time consuming. There's a lot of in the trenches work, uh, bouncing between spreadsheets and whatnot and going in there and, and physically building the campaigns. Uh, what you want to be able to do is, is um, front load the time that you spend doing that sort of thing and that you want to uh, spend your time doing that before you're spending your advertiser's money, your client's money, uh, and understand really what's going on from the nuts and bolts perspective. So what I mean by front load your time is that you want to go out there map the website, prepare all the ad groups, and get all the ad copy, get it up on multiple search engines if necessary between Google, Yahoo, MSN, uh, to make sure that everything is in place when you go to launch the campaign all at once so you're not building as you're spending money. So that also gives you a great baseline, especially when you do things across network. They get to see if there's any particular things that are performing uh, better on Google versus Yahoo versus MSN Bing. So what I mean by that front load your time is that do all that grunt work up front so you're not scrambling later on um, while you're getting information coming in. And knowing where to spend that time, of course, is hugely important that you want to, uh, to know that knowing where to spend the time and then the conversation around the buying cycle, if there's particular pushable items that need to get uh, out the door, if there's real specific information uh, around the uh, the geotargeting that you need to focus on, you want to know where to, to spend all that time because you only will probably have a finite amount of time before you set the expectation of when a campaign is going to launch and during that building offline process uh, and all the information that surrounds that and knowing how to uh, not only just work hard but work smart when it comes to uh, building your campaign. Before you really even jump into that, another thing to consider too is how good is the site working? Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to uh, say that, you know, Paid search is a great vehicle for delivering traffic. The uh, analogy that we always use around the office is that it's up to us as paid search experts to get people to the party. Um, our job is simply sending out the invitations and then getting people there. And what's going to keep the people at the party is you know, what the dr drinks you're ser serving, the music you're playing, uh, the refreshments that you provide. And that's really the, the refreshments and the entertainment side. And once people get there, it's up to the people that own the website. So it's, you know, putting your marketing hat back on, you can take a look at just how the website's using, uh, working in general from a usability standpoint. There's things that are easy to find and it's, it's logical layout. 
Um, and then the, you know things are easy to read that they're not highly technical terms that it's it's on par with the the readers of the website and the audience of the uh, target market uh, that things are coming up organically which you know plays into some of the things with quality score which we'll touch on in a, in a minute uh, and the relevant keywords in there and, and then that you know what we're looking at from a paid search perspective is also showing up in the content of the website and of course that the site works quickly you know I, I think uh, We've all gotten spoiled with uh, DPSL and T1 connections and whatnot to uh, to have fast websites, and you have a website that full slows that uh, definitely changes the engagement level of how long people spend on the website, uh, how many page views they actually go see, and that the content's fresh, and then you want people to come to the website because it's it's new content, it's original. There's a particularly good blog on a website that that really drives people the engagement, an excuse to come back, even if some of the usability might be the same. That there's um, a reason to come back and take a look and see what's being written on the website. And then of course, you know, knowing that user behavior, you know, we touched on that earlier with knowing day parting and then buying cycles and then geotargeting and whatnot too. Um, but understand that customer before you go launch and understand those buying cycles. Uh, and then, you know, where they have particular issues around day parting. If it's a B2B type uh, advertiser, you know that, you know, your weekends are probably going to be pretty quiet. If it's retail, brick and mortar, you know, the Saturdays are fairly traditional around um, being the busiest day of the week and of course seasonality with either season changing or holiday season and things like that. And then uh, you know you also if you have the ability to then go into how uh, call centers work if there's that type of situation set up. Uh, the nice thing about call centers and like lead forms is that you're really getting some good insight to the people that are engaging the customers on a daily basis. You get to see the type of information that might be tied into a website and have information around what is actually happening when a conversion, a sale, a lead, or just simply a site visit is taking place. And then learn the space. You know, if there's particular industry magazines you need to be reading or blogs or leveraging the information that is already coming from the uh, client and advertiser, uh, knowing that that space and, and, and we have the ability to be exposed to a lot of different things and learn something about everything. The more that you know and the more that you identify with your clients, the, the better you'll understand how people might go find those businesses uh, online. And then, you know, ask, the, ask your uh, clients those key questions, you know, for information about if there's particular industry-specific terms that only people in that space know, uh, or if there's uh, information around knowing those, those buying patterns. And then manicure your campaigns. And what we mean by this, you know, after you go front load your time, you spend all the time building things out, getting things mapped out, everything sure is covered. Um, that's not something I just, you know, to use a round for appeal term, it's not something you just set it, forget it, and just let it run. Uh, you want to take a second pass through uh, what's going on with the website, what's going on with uh, what's working for particular ad groups, uh, pull keywords out that are driving a bunch of impressions, maybe try testing them in their own ad group with separate ads. Uh, you know, change your, the landing pages that are being used for destination URLs, write new ads, uh, and most importantly, change one variable at a time and then let it sit. What I mean by all this is that when you put something in and into the paid search, you want to let it at least go through a, a cycle of like a week of their particular longer purchase cycles that you get insight to. Let it sit for those times. Changing one variable at a time if you will help you identify what's working and it's not. If you go in and you change a bunch of ad groups around and, and you're, you're changing multiple variables and something works, that's great. However, when you try to go reproduce that behavior uh, when going changing the, the back end, the nuts and bolts of a paid search campaign, you're not necessarily getting all the correct information uh, about what is actually affecting the campaign. And then when you're done with that, start at the top and do it all over again. Uh, I always tell people when you're testing, you should test, test, and then when you're done testing, test some more. What we wanted to talk about next was how you guys can find high converting uh, keywords and how using the long tail can help you accomplish that. Thanks, Elaine. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, long tail keywords are, are keywords that, you know, um, not necessarily are, are the top of mind keywords that you're getting people that are a little bit further down in the buying cycle that instead of just looking for hats, that they're looking for really particular hats with a color and size in mind, uh, things like that. This graph here is here to show you, you know, the difference between what, uh, STO Moz is, is calling the fat head chunky middle and long tail and just where those percentages live in and also the, the number of monthly searches there. It's a, a great graph to show you that if you were to put 10 people in the room and look at a website, whether they have paid search experience or not, of those 10 people, the 80% of those keywords are probably going to be the same. Things start to get really interesting when you get into those other 20% of, 
of those keywords where you start to get into the individual behaviors of how someone might go look for particular things on a website. And I think that this graph illustrates that nicely. Um, what's really nice about also long tail keywords is that you get people further down in the buying cycle instead of just looking up. So it's a you know winter item that you know instead of people just looking for like warm hats that this is something that is very niche, very specific. Uh, you're talking about the color, what it's made out of, um, some of the attributes of a particular lining. Uh, and you start to see things that uh, you don't get to see the real particular things. Everyone knows that Polar Tech is a fleece particular material that's very warm, uh, and that's pointing to a page that has highly relevant products that are all black, all fleece lined, uh, and that they're all lined with uh, warm insulating material. So when you get into those longer tail keywords, what you'll typically see is that you're getting things that are uh, going to be typically lower search volume, but higher converting uh, traffic. When you also you do find those like root keywords that are like around balaclava and whatnot, uh, you do have the uh, ability to, to go build those permutations in the longer tail. Uh, so you know, keeping with the analogy of the Collins pickaxe, uh, that you know that could be a very good root keyword right there. Uh, so you get to see all the things, all the different uh, variations of that. And, uh, things of around that, you know, you have that root keyword of Collins pickaxe, but here's things that have product attributes as a wood handle, 16 inch blade, uh, combinations there, there within. Um, we started thinking that mentality and thinking about how there are different ways in the longer strings of keywords that you put together can typically get rewarded with cheaper clicks uh, that do convert. Uh, it's real easy to just to start gearing your mind towards the longer tail. And of course, you know, dive into the data. You know, if, if you're not staring at spreadsheets for uh, the better part of the day, understanding what's going on from click-through rates and impressions and conversions, um, you're letting you want to really let the numbers tell a story. Uh, you know, this is uh, something that we live in a numbers uh, community here, and this is something that you should constantly be looking at and then seeing what those things are telling you to do next. And of course, there's a bunch of great tools out there too, uh, and the majority of these are free, at least to use. Uh, Superficially, uh, Google Analytics, of course, the free tracking tool that just about everyone that I've ever worked with is using it for free, and it's it's a great tool to determine engagement of the website. Um, Google AdWords has its own fantastic tools if you guys have any keyword research in there. Um, there's some nice things in there. We rank very nice for uh, just seeing how overall site health, spy foo some competitive information in there too. Um, and there's all, there's tons of tools out there. We just grab some examples that we use in the office, um, and even some that we do pay for a little bit. So you're offline. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, folks. Um, yeah, we just had some uh, technical difficulties with our connection here. Um, so yeah, so let's actually let's probably back this up a little bit. Well, going back to what the initial slide had been, and we wanted to talk to you guys about integrating PPC into the rest of your marketing campaign and the importance of doing so. Okay, cool. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, information that that's you know, pay per click doesn't live in a vacuum. You know, that you're, we've definitely talked about how websites work and how people find information, but we also want to make sure that you know we're integrating with the rest of what's going on in the marketing world with advertisers. If, if uh, you have a particular advertiser that really leverages themselves as being a low cost leader, you want to make sure that you're highlighting those types of attributes uh, in your paid search terms and whatnot to uh, place it into the quality score and whatnot, uh, everything that's going on, and it just keeps the, the consistent messaging. Of that so and then also uh, you know you want to use the what you're finding in that paid search things if you are finding things that are outside of the product messaging that you, you're providing that feedback loop 
uh, to a, a website owner or business uh, for the information around um, you know, what people are particularly searching on. You can do full search query reports and actually see how people um, go in and search and get the capture the information of the actual search query that, that takes place uh, and, and understand that. In fact, earlier this week I found a particular advertiser that uh, was getting a lot of search query information about why they are having problems with their products. So that's a great feedback loop on the behavior of consumers to provide back to an advertiser saying, hey, I think you're having problems with this particular product because there's a tremendous amount of search traffic out there for people learning about what's broken. Uh, if it's something that you know you might want to update or uh, you know provide that information back out there, that's part of you know using the, the PPC to refine the messaging as well. The nice thing about pay per click is that you're not waiting also for uh, results to come in uh, organically. That this is all things that are actionable and things that uh, you get to go work on immediately and uh, drive track to around that content. Uh, consistent messaging tying in with that too, um, you know, keeping with the whole uh, cycling theme here. Uh, this is something that uh, you get to see the actual search query here, the Santa Cruz mountain bikes. Uh, you get uh, matches directly into the ad copy of the particular uh, bike. When something does match, of course, the search query to the ad copy, you get things bolded, and you can see uh, this is a fantastic uh, ad that has been targeted to uh, Santa Cruz bikes. Santa Cruz bikes that matches everything in the ad copy that's bolding, and then the, the field below that is all the information, everything that is on there. Um, from a standpoint of everything Santa Cruz, and uh, it's a fantastically targeted website, and this should probably be returning uh, good quality scores for the field. Uh, another thing to take care of uh, that you might want to look into is microsites a little bit. These are uh, specific landing pages that are driving uh, a conversion action uh, information immediately. So this is stuff that uh, you know you get someone to land this page. They can learn about the Help to Achieve program from Merrill Lynch. Um, and you get all the information in there, and then you get a nice big button there for them to either, you know, probably either uh, fill out some lead generation information or connect some lives via Skype or a, a web chat type. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Yeah, just a little wireless issues. I think we've uh, got to figure it out. So, yeah, to take it from the top, the microsites uh, designed really to drive the, the lead gen information. Uh, you know, these are, are typically sites that uh, don't necessarily drive engagement time on site or, or multiple page views per visitor, but it gets someone talking to someone immediately about what they're after. A uh, very effective tool that are typically sites that you cannot navigate to within the regular website that they're, they're going straight to a landing page that is optimized to deliver specific information for a specific audience and getting them talking to someone right away. Now we'll kind of focus on what you guys as an agency really want to be reporting back to your clients when it comes to paid search. Yeah, and I, you can kind of group this under, you know, the, the majority of expectation setting, you know, the level setting and then saying, before we go spend your money on, on paid search and, and driving you clicks, let's be very clear about how we're going to measure success. Uh, and all the information uh, around that, and, and, and the, the real specific information, and also you know keep those in mind with the kind of those those three major buckets of e-commerce lead generation and branding. Uh, you know determine really what the conversion is. is it a hard sale? Is it a form fill out? Is it a site visit? Um, and to really, if, if you're getting some grindage there and hitting some stiction with you know what really works there, it, it might be helpful to say how do you measure success in business in general. And you know, is it something that is a sale? Is it the lead gen, or simply getting people to be aware of who you are? And uh, determining your client's cost per acquisition is, is something that's that's 
what is that particularly worth? You know, how much are they willing to spend in search traffic volume to make a sale? How much are they willing to spend per lead uh, to uh, to get a form fill out or uh, a live chat started and stuff like that? And, the, and the, the amount that they're willing to pay in search traffic. And if it's branding, then that conversation becomes very uh, quick and it, it revolves around how much you're willing to spend on the traffic. Uh, things to also kind of keep in mind to, to building up that, that cost per acquisition model. Um, when determining that CPA, uh, it's a, another number that can be hard to difficult to assess and, and figure out is figure out like you know what the average cost of a sale is worth to, uh, online that just happens organically. Is there information around how much markup, how much margins in there, uh, and establishing a baseline in there. And then of course you know if they have it in their budget to, to really go after and chase that. If they have a, a low ticket a low ticket sale. Uh, that you know, if they're buying very expensive search traffic, they're going to be losing money on every acquisition. And then also, then to, to kind of tying back into that manicuring conversation, uh, is this stuff that you know was uh, completely reasonable? And is this something we should take a look at? You know, if you set a, a cost per acquisition at twenty-five dollars, but things are coming in at a hundred dollars, uh, of course that's a sign that something's not you know correctly uh, being sent traffic to. But is the expectation around that? You know, is a hundred dollars a lead worthy for a lifetime? Uh, value of a client that could be thousands of dollars over a number of years, and is that a, a reasonable cost per acquisition number on it, or should it be higher? So things like that can help kind of uh, get the, the, the conversation going and cost per acquisition. And then also the, the data information. Of course, this is a, a, a numbers-driven business, and you want to be very clear uh, about how you go out there and, and, and go gather the information and what you're willing to share with them. Uh, you know, we work. Uh, it tends to work better that the more transparent you are, uh, the more of a, a better flow of communication. The more willing you'll be to pick up the phone and call your advertiser and say, "Hey, things are not going as well as we see," and here's the information that you've been seeing all this while. And then, uh, you know, level set that and say, like, we are going to share the keywords and what we're spending on it. Uh, you can talk about the various pricing models that you might have in particular around how you do the media spend. Uh, you know, what's the conversion volume goal for the month? What, what's the, the CPA volume trying to stay below? And of course, you know, how much money of theirs are you going to be spending? And the more time you spend on the front end of setting those expectations, the much easier the update phone calls become uh, and the, the ability to retain those clients and, and keep them spending money with you because uh, you're handling it so well. Uh, we'd like to give you guys a quick overview of who we are as Trot and how we work with agencies. I think it'll be interesting for uh, your agents as an agency. Yeah, what's interesting about the, the way that Trot does things, uh, the, what we change between what we do for uh, advertisers and what we do uh, directly when we work with them versus what we do for an agency that might be working with their own advertisers. Uh, is that the the value proposition is very similar, but the, what's nice is that you know you have the ability to spend a lot more time working with us and getting the expectations set. You know your your job is to maintain things with uh, your client as opposed to a direct advertiser who has to run a business on top of everything like that. Either way, it still gets down to uh, the the time saving and whatnot. Um, the, the way that we work is that we don't charge anything for a setup fee. Uh, and that we get people working on your campaign. So to go a little bit deeper into how we get paid and the way that works is that we establish a, a baseline cost per click uh, number as a bid price that goes into our system. We try to buy the media for a little bit cheaper uh, and we will split between the people that are working on um, the, the campaign versus you know what they're buying things for. Um, we'll take a little bit of that on a per click basis. Ideally, what we're trying to do is, is get uh, you to have an, uh, an advertiser that's working around a conversion number, and we try to reach those conversion numbers, uh, and then eventually move things over to a pricing model uh, where we are being paid per acquisition, which tend to be much higher margins uh, versus then how much we're paying per click. And that's almost another whole can of worms that we could probably spend uh, probably another webinar on pricing models and whatnot too. But uh, the, the baseline pricing model is that we are selling clicks for a predetermined amount um, uh, per click. So we are a crowdsourcing company and the way that that works is that we have over 500 certified paid search experts that are working in our community that work on behalf of advertisers and they have the ability to opt in and work on campaigns that they particularly know that they're suited on if, if they have expertise in a particular area on top of a layer of paid search knowledge uh, that they will opt in to join a, a particular advertiser. 
Um, we screen all these people. We have an entire department within the com company that is uh, strictly tasked with just maintaining the quality of the people that work on those campaigns, uh, and they number in the hundreds. Uh, what we also can, uh, what you can also use for Trot is that, that scalability, that, that grunt work that normally goes into building and mapping out a big, large e-commerce campaign, or or someone that has multiple offerings. That that, that time consumption is something that you no longer uh, would be doing at the agency level. You'll provide us guidance to get started, and then the optimizers that opt into your campaign and work on your behalf are going to go out there and do all that grunt work for you. Uh, what's really nice is that you then get to already instantly change your your time focus from the nuts and bolts strategic block and tackling to a much more um, overview directional you know you become like your own kind of mini VP of marketing uh, of that particular advertiser and website uh, they always we will rely on uh, people working within agencies and, and working direct with advertisers that we still will want that uh, contextual knowledge base that we still you know, you should, we still are going to leverage the information that you have about how a particular business works around the things like Dave Harding, geographics, subject matters, industry terms, things like that. And then also we provide you a platform for you to talk directly to an optimizers that are working on your campaign. We provide them the real names and a messaging platform to say, hey, you know, Mr. Optimizer working on my campaign, this looks great, or no, you need to just kind of fundamentally shift your focus a little bit, or, you know, there's particular things I want you to focus on instead of that, and uh, we have several ways for you to go communicate that with just simply the uh, ad copy keyword approval and then the direct messaging. And then of course we can go generate customizable reports that are exportable that uh, you can put your own wrapping around and call your own and, and deliver to the client. Uh, we have the ability to do uh, you know custom reporting around how your uh, client digests information and what information is important to them, and uh, you'd be working with people like myself and the rest of the account management team to, to really drill into what is the information that they're really looking for. Well, thank you so much, Dan. We will be now taking questions from the audience. If you haven't had a chance to send any questions you have, uh, feel free to do so. Our first question from the audience is asking the question, what's the difference between a regular website and a microsite? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the real difference is that uh, microsites are, are, first of all, much smaller, um, hence the name microsite. Uh, they're typically about three pages long, that they're, they're, they're web pages that you cannot navigate to uh, directly from a home page of a website or anyone else internal, um, that they have a, typically a singular message and you're trying to move the conversion flow very quickly from someone landing on a page, reading that information, filling out a form, hitting submit button, and they're done, and they might get a link back. Uh, to uh, you know the the home page at that point, but you're trying to not drive page views, not necessarily trying to get, uh, gather um, you know engagement and whatnot, but you're really trying to, to capture information, move them along quickly, uh, get them back to a home page. Great, no. thank thank you, Dan. Um, our next question from the audience was concerning how long does it take uh, from a time perspective to map out an e-commerce site. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I kind of hinted to that stuff earlier. Um, it depends is the short answer. If you got a, a an advertiser, that, a website owner that has you know thousands of product SKUs, you know that there's there's particular things that uh, you want to go after, knowing where to spend that time. As far as like a time component, if you have a team of you know two or three people, it can take you as long as two weeks working full time to go map out of site to make sure that you're pointing ads to particular landing pages, you have ads that are very specific to it. Um, of course there's all kinds of different tricks to, to help with that as well with like things like dynamic keyword insertion and whatnot too to help leverage that. But the, the more time you spend on writing things that are ads that are poignant and, and front loading that time, uh, the more helpful it'll be. So I'm definitely a big advocate before spending a penny that you know things are in place and uh, that at least the generalities of a website are mapped out. So I'd give you an answer, I'd probably say about two weeks. You know, full time work to really go map out a uh, a fairly extensive site and pretty quick. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next question was related to the type of uh, clients that we take on. Someone had a question about the minimum budget that we're willing to spend, and if we take on clients mm -hmm. who spend a thousand a month in paid search. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely work with people at the um, at the thousand dollar a month uh, level. 
uh, we, we have some, some different tiers as far as the way our, our pricing metric goes and whatnot. Um, so what you get at is, uh, from that $1,000 a month paid search level is that you'll definitely get all the, um, the intros into the community, uh, getting uh, ad copywritten, setting all the thresholds uh, for the bid pricing, which is a negotiation. Um, and I don't mean to sound so formal with that, but that's something that happens between the account management team and whoever's working on that account um, on the client side of things, and then we figure out that, that information. Uh, depending on the industry, you know, if, if someone were to come to us with, uh, for example, auto insurance lead generation, and they want to spend thousand dollars a month. I mean, you're you're hanging in the same room as some of the uh, the biggest spenders out there that spend, you know, probably over hundred thousand dollars a month on that. So it all depends. But yeah, we're always open to discussion for a thousand dollar a month campaign, and I'd say probably a good thirty percent of our advertisers are in and around that budget. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, next question I can actually tackle. Uh, someone was wondering if the webinar is being recorded and will be shared at a later point. We are recording the webinar and we will send out the recording next week via email, so keep an eye out for that in your inboxes. Um, and then we have a, another question that wanted to know, who makes up the majority of the clientele at Trotta? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, I would say the majority of the clientele definitely fall into the e-commerce and uh, lead generation. Uh, and I'd probably say it's almost like a 40-40 split. So 40% lead gen, 40% e-commerce, and probably about 20% just straight branding. Uh, but yeah, we uh, are always seeing new businesses that are coming in and whatnot. Um, we're always willing to take a look at that. But yeah, we do a lot in e-commerce, a lot in lead gen, uh, and we do do some branding work. I mean, everyone, it's, it's interesting over the past couple of years that people have been very interested in, in getting around information around the conversion metric. It's nice to see clicks and people visiting the website, but um, no one's really in the business of just generating clicks when they have things like brick and mortar stores or products or, or services that they sell. Great. Um, and another question from the audience is, what sort of PPC campaign can you run for smaller businesses, e.g. independent insurance agents, local small businesses, for like bikes, retail, personal trainers? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So um, we actually have several advertisers that you know only offer uh, services within you know particular cities and whatnot. Uh, you know, uh, depending on, on where they're they're working, and we can go target and, and, and cut up the United States however we like. Um, you know, obviously a personal trainer in Chicago is not going to be doing any business uh, in Denver. So you know, for that example, we would uh, just be running uh, paid search in Chicago for a particular area, and then, and then focus around all that same type of information about. You know what particular areas of focus they have and what they do differently than anyone else, um, and then send uh, information to that website. So the type of that would probably be for like a personal trainer or services type thing would be lead generation, for having you to pick up the phone, fill out a form to submit to contact us, uh, and then we can be very narrowly focused around what geographics we're, we're operating. Great. Uh, we have another question from the audience wanting to know what is the advantage of using Trata over doing it yourself. Awesome question. Uh, so what's nice is that, uh, which, first of all, from like a mechanical standpoint, when we create an ad in a keyword uh, in our system, it will go out to Yahoo, uh, Google, and Bing all in parallel from one singular application. So the, the triplicating your efforts as far as uh, uh, doing everything in, in Google, you know, the back in the agency days, we typically set the expectation that we would uh, you know, we'd go build in Google, test in Google, because that's the majority of the search traffic, you know, about 60% of it, and then we'll take what's working and then going out and testing Yahoo and MSN uh, slash Bing. Uh, here you, you get to go test it right from the get-go. We have customized tools that will show you where the traffic's coming from a particular search engine. The nice thing, too, is that when you, uh, you know, when you have two heads that are better than one is one thing, but, you know, 500 heads is better than one potentially working on your campaign. What happens there is that you, uh, you get the layer of certainly the search expertise and different people lurking looking at um, you know, how people might go find uh, your information. But you also get that, that, that behavioral layer, too, on top of that, that paid search technique. If I'm sitting across the table with uh, uh, a fellow cyclist, the way that we're going to go find bike tires and behaviorally go um, use the search engines is probably going to be a little bit different. And that's when you, get, when you start multiplying that um, you know, across uh, numerous uh, optimizers about how they might go shop for information. Um, that you uh, you get to leverage that, and then also you can also then that leverages too if you have people that you know um, that might be the, the customer for that particular product. If you have moms that work at home uh, on the Trotta network, uh, that's a huge market to go after for like 
give you products and uh, probably something I couldn't bring to the table on a behavioral level, you know, if that comic, if that uh, client came to me from an agency standpoint, but that mom sitting in her house working on paid search, you know, much better insight to, you know, what might be the pain points, what might be some uh, good keyword selection, that sort of thing. Great. Um, it seems we have one last question. What what ad networks does try to work on, uh -huh. and uh, what should I spend on each network for my clients? As much as possible. Uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, that's all stuff that we would negotiate out and and, uh, and and talk you through as far as to where to, to split your money. So the, the way it sits right now, we have Google Yahoo up and running. We are putting the finishing touches on Bing, and we should probably be network wide within a week or two on that. We're just doing some some beta testing internally on that. So you have the ability to take that monthly budget, whatever that is, and then break it up by percent. Um, there's been a much argument in the office around uh, the people that, that work on the account side of where to split stuff once Bing gets introduced. And if you were to go out and look at like Nielsen ratings right now, you'd see that, that Bing, uh, I think, is eroding away at some of the Yahoo traffic. So um, the, the short answer to all that is I'd probably run 70% on Google, 15% uh, on Bing, and 15% on Yahoo. The nice thing is that we'll get some nice actionable information back in some of the charts uh, as to where to put that bias. If we find things that you know are particularly running well in Yahoo and not on the other two, we can switch that bias around at a moment's notice. So it's not just uh, something that's, that's etched in stone. Those are all the sort of type of uh, uh, parameters that we'll go out and change as needed as we get some information back. It, it seems we have two more questions. Okay. So cool. thanks, everyone, for sticking with us. Our next question is, how important is consistency? How many campaigns each year, month in PPC advertising, or can it be effective when used sporadically? I mean, yeah, sporadically is all the time. Um, you know, there's advertisers that are very sensitive to uh, seasonality and, and, and things like that. We can run things, uh, you know, just for a short season and limited time. Um, you know, if you are in the retail shopping business, you know, you should be ramping up to, to get your paid search campaigns up and robust and running and figured out by August. Um, when things start to get down to the wire, uh, you'll, uh, for the holiday shopping season, you know things will will uh, you know be in place for that. Um, am I getting everything there? Yep. Okay. And then uh, so yeah, and then there's there's things that are just you know around tax season and whatnot. So maybe it makes sense to look at run things for you know last two months leading up to um, April fifteenth. So yeah, there's the seasonality of what happens in a business is exactly the same thing that we're going to utilize when we're we're talking about seasonality uh, in paid search. So you know the, the thing that but to keep in mind is that we're still dealing with people that are consumers. They're just happen to be sitting in front of their computer instead of in front of their television or walking in the front door of a store. You know, so you're still sensitive to all the seasonality, and we can we can run things uh, to coincide with all that. Great. Um, we have one final question that I will tackle. It is: Are there any plans to expand to the display networks, or is this concentrated on search only? You know, at Trotta, we're always looking at the best ways to be serving our clients, and I think we'll be identifying ways down the road um, that will include display, but it's not in the immediate future. Okay, everybody, we really appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. We'll be sending out the webinar um, next week, and be sure to let us know if you have any questions um, in the meanwhile. Thanks, everybody.